Good evening and welcome to the TNT show. I'm John Drummond and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes and I can guarantee these are going to be 60 extremely interesting minutes. I'm so grateful to you all for joining us. It's a real privilege to be able to provide this show for you. And again, as I say most weeks, thanks to you, the TNT show and Indie Live are going from strength to strength and we're delivering more and more exciting shows. You can watch, for example, the TNT show on IndieLive.net. It's streamed out to YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. Plus, if you want to, you can check out some of the 130-odd previous shows over the last couple of odd years uh, on YouTube. All the previous shows are there, unedited, just the way they happened. Well, I, again, as I often say, if you're upset by media coverage of political events, where you think that journalism has been junked, in favor of stenography and or rehashed press releases. If you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it, we're here for you. Well, it's been another great day for British democracy. You may recall that on taking office, the prime minister pledged, and I quote, my government will have intense integrity, professionalism and accountability at every level. Today, however, he's saying, I need an ethics advisor uh, to help me tell the difference between right and wrong. Why what? Uh, we've come down from the mountain at quite a considerable rate. <laughs> you know, tonight we are talking to a very special guest. We'll be discussing football. We'll be talking about Wales. We'll be talking about constitutions. And if we get some time, we can maybe fit in a few words about Robert Burns and so much more besides. We'll be talking with Laura McAllister, who's Professor of Public Policy and Governance of Wales. Laura is also an accomplished footballer who has been capped 24 times for her national team. And she's taking your questions live. There's still time to get your point considered. Details are on the screen shortly. TNT, as you know, stands for the Nation Talks. Uh, so in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight, the Nation Talks to Laura McAllister. Thanks so much for joining us, Laura. How are you? Well, thank, thank you to you, John, and uh, as we say in Wales, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be with you. <laughs> you know, the place where I hear most Welsh, this is going to sound surprising, maybe not, is from Mark Labette <laughs> on, on his show, on the, on the show. I, it's just remarkable how little Welsh is spoken on the network. Yeah, I mean, gosh, it's hard It's hard for us to see that in Wales, of course, because we have our own fourth channel, S Pedorac, S4C, where all of the uh, programmes are in through the medium of Welsh. And, and actually, and our own radio station, of course, uh, Radio Cymru. And so we're quite used to um, the Welsh language featuring in all of our political debates as well, because of the official bilingualism of the Senate and our first ministers were speaking. So I guess, you know, if you live outside Wales, you probably have a very different interpretation of the bilingualism of Wales to the one that we have. I think you're probably right. In fact, I know you're right. And your point about the, the, the first minister speaking Welsh is, is terrific. Uh, and in fact, I suspect many of our audience tonight will be thinking about the enormous contrast that they perceive between uh, a Labour first minister in Wales and his counterparts in Scotland who all seem to be terribly, terribly conservative. And I don't really get that impression about the First Minister of Wales. Am I wrong or am I right? He, he's a very um, interesting and different character, for sure. I mean, Mark Drakeford was a professor here in Cardiff University with, with us, actually. Um, he was a professor of social policy in the School of Social Sciences. And so he came into politics relatively late. He was a councillor in a uh, part of Cardiff where I live, actually, in Cardiff West, um, and was formerly an advisor to uh, Rodri Morgan, one of the previous first ministers of Wales, who was a spe special advisor there, but very much a policy-oriented person and very much data and evidence-driven, as you'd expect a, an academic social scientist to be. So he's not your classic politician who always wanted to be a politician. I mean, I think Mark would admit to um, most people that he never really wanted to be a politician. He, and he was 
ambivalent about becoming first minister, which he said in an interview, actually, during the election campaign, which went down like a lead balloon, as you can imagine. But I think that kind of that kind of honesty marks him out. You know, he's he's different to other politicians. You can you can like him or loathe him. And th there are two camps on this, but he's certainly not your conventional, um, classic, groomed um, career politician of the type that we see pretty much everywhere else. Yeah, I would agree with that. He comes across to me sounding a good deal less polemical than his counterparts elsewhere. Uh, and again, as you say, studious, uh, thoughtful uh, and measured. Uh, and that's a real treat nowadays <laughs> when you look yeah, around. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, you know, I mean, in some ways it's sort of emblematic of, of where we are in Welsh politics. And, and there are highs and lows to that. I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to this, but... You know, Welsh politics is, is less overtly partisan or binary than Scottish politics. I mean, I, you know, I've been talking about Scottish politics earlier today with a good colleague and friend of mine, Elsa Henderson, who I'm sure lots of your listeners will know from Edinburgh University. And, you know, we often talk about the kind of tribes in politics, you know, how people vote and how, what characterises their political ideology. And clearly in Scotland, you know, you've got, um, you've got you know, yes, no, indie voters and you've got remain remain leave brexit voters and then you've got other dynamics that come into play but in in wales it is slightly different and the main reason for that is because the labor party is such a different animal here i mean plaid cymru is a very different animal to the snp that goes without saying but the labor party is hugely different to the scottish labor party you know it's a much much more nuanced soft nationalist party and it has no problem at all having debates about the future of the union which again i'm sure we'll come on to because that was the that was the genesis of our constitutional commission was the fact that welsh labor were quite happy to have a, a debate on anything including independence that's extraordinary absolutely extraordinary but tell me before we get there a little bit about playing football i mean <laughs> wow. did you get a lot of recognition i mean you get you don't get 24 caps for, for not being good you get you have to be good well, to oh, well i hope i was a, yeah i hope i was a half decent uh, player yeah i'm trying to think of a scottish uh, male or female equivalent to the way i played i mean from from a welsh point of view i was a bit of a kevin radcliffe some of your your viewers will know kevin everton uh, wales yeah. I, played, yeah. I played sweeper basically so yeah. Um, you know, a sign of a good game for me was that I didn't have to get my shorts dirty, uh, you know, that I'd read the game enough to, to anticipate uh, attacks before I had to make a tackle. But no, look, I played I played from 95 to 2002, I think. And I played every game in that period, which amounted to the great total of 24 caps, because at that point, Welsh women's football was really in its infancy. Um, and in fact, some of us had campaigned who played for clubs i played for cardiff city and we campaigned for the welsh fa to take on the women's game and give it some official credibility and status yeah. and infrastructure yeah. so i was fortunate to be selected then in the first uh, international squads but it was really at the beginning of the journey i mean you know the scots women's team have done brilliantly you know qualifying for euros and world cups we, we yeah. we're not quite there yet but we're probably close to the scots now in terms of profile Okay, narrowly missed out on the uh, Women's World Cup in Australia, New Zealand in the playoffs. Um, and we'll, we, we're, we're almost certainly um, going to give it everything to qualify for the next Euros. But when I was playing, you know, it was hand-me-downs from the men's uh, kit, you know, kit that was too big, to us, big for us poor travel arrangements, you know, poor accommodation. So it wasn't it wasn't where we are now in the women's game. But nevertheless, you know, every stride takes the game further. And, you know, I'm proud to have played my small part in advancing the women's game. Yeah, good for you. And But you're still playing a part. You're, you're deputy chair of UEFA's, uh, UEFA's Women's Football Committee. Yeah, that's right. And actually, um, since my I haven't updated my biog on this, but I'm about to stand in a quite an important election for UEFA. Oh. Um, so the nominations will close next week for positions on the UEFA Exco, the executive committee that is the effectively the most uh, significant and senior decision making body in European football. And I'm standing for a position on that, supported by the Football Association of Wales. Um, and the nominations will close. We'll see who's up against me, if anybody. But, you know, I'm quite I'm quite optimistic that we've got a decent chance because I stood in an election uh, two years ago now for a place on FIFA Council. 
and I yeah. came within six votes of winning it. So right. I think I've built up a body of support. I mean, you never know with these elections; they're they're more unpredictable than political elections, believe me. <laughs> but we we'll give it we'll give it our best shot, you know. And we're hopeful that this would be the first time Wales has ever had a position on UEFA for Exco. When you say UEFA Exco, is that is that the very top governing body reporting to the? It is. It is. The president chairs Exco, so it's effectively the board, the board of European football. So it looks after everything to do with funding, you know, broadcasting, Champions League, Euros, uh, men's, women's football, everything, basically, officials, refereeing. So it's a big opportunity. I mean, not not for me particularly, but for for us as a country, Wales, Wales. But also, I think, for smaller nations like Scotland and Ireland and yeah. Wales and Slovenia, yeah. Yeah. because, you know, often our, our views on how the game develops don't get aired effectively. Yeah. And I think having somebody from a country like like ours will be important. And I've got fabulous relationships with the Scottish FA and with lots of colleagues there. So, you know, we'll be certainly trying to listen to what the Scots tell us about how they want to see European football developed. And I hope I'll be able to represent that as well there. Can I ask you a leading question? I hesitate to ask it because it may damn your chances. <laughs> Would you have voted for Qatar? Oh, I don't mind answering that because I've said it publicly Publicly, anyway. No, I wouldn't. Um, I think it was a complete mistake. Um, and we know, we know that there were lots of dynamics influencing that vote, um, many of which were illegal and corrupt. Um, but even if you took away all of that, the illegality and the bribery and all the rest of it, I don't think the vote was a sensible or a fair one. Because if you if you think back to 2012, when the vote was uh, made, there was no discussion about moving the tournament to the winter. It was going to be a summer tournament. There was no consideration of how players and fans would have coped with playing in 50 degrees heat in uh, Doha. And I was out in the World Cup. I mean, we could talk about this later. I was out in the World Cup as an ambassador for uh, Cymru, for Wales. Um, and it was hot enough in November. You know, it was 24, 25 degrees, sometimes 28 degrees. So, you know, it's, it's it was never a World Cup that should have been awarded to Qatar. Yeah. And then that's just the practicalities. Then you go into human rights, workers' rights, you know, migrant workers' rights who clearly have been treated um uh, not even as second or third class citizens, but are almost as slaves, really, that can be owned in order to do work for on the stadiums. And then you take into account LGBT rights, women's rights, yeah. and so on. And, you know, for a whole host of reasons, um, the World Cup shouldn't have gone to Qatar, and I, I certainly wouldn't have supported it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, my, my son and um, and grandson went there. They, they watched uh, uh, Wales versus England, I think, was one of the matches okay. they watched. Yeah. And, and they said it was it was bearable because the stadium the stadium had air conditioning. Yes, that's right. Underneath the seats. Yes, that's so it. I started to ask myself, how much does it cost? Yeah. Well, there's a sustainability agenda, yeah. isn't there? There's a green agenda. So you can you can keep going with this, but actually, do, do you know it? It doesn't. It, I'm not saying this out of tune with European nations. I mean, those of us who are would class ourselves as progressive European nations, you know, the likes of the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Switzerland, England, Wales, all of us wanted to show our values in Qatar and we were stopped from doing it, you know, with the, the one love armband, with the rainbow bucket hats that the yeah. Welsh fans wear, with our, our discussions on LGBT rights and women's rights. And, you know, you can... So in, in a sense, this is the zeitgeist of European football. But of course, other parts of the world think very differently about Qatar. And yeah. the, the kind of geopolitics of football is massive. And, you know, it's, it's, it has an effect on every election and every decision that football makes. Well, it sounds to me like you might be a breath of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah, I think I'll certainly be different anyway, which gives you some leverage. Can I ask you, could you let us know? when the election is over and what the outcome yeah, of course. was? Yeah, of course. And for, for your viewers, um, the election takes place at the Congress, the UEFA Congress in Lisbon on the 5th of April. Oh. Um, and that's when the results will be announced. I mean, if somebody isn't standing against me, then I might be no known to be successful earlier. But, you know, I suspect it will be an election, a contested yeah. election, in which case we'll know on the 5th of, of uh, April. Oh, I'll go look out for that. I do let us know. That sounds terrific. It's super. And, and every... Out I wish you on behalf of everyone watching and listening tonight every success there because Thank you, there's no question that the 
if I could use someone like you, it seems to me, because uh, particularly in the light of what you've just said, I mean, it, I, as you say, there's so many other issues in football that need tackling too. And uh, this, I, I mean, we could go on and go on, but let's not do that. We've got so much to talk about. And I know you have to leave at quarter two or 10 two, yes. so I have to bear that in mind so we can press on. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, can we talk a bit about your interim report? Uh, and maybe you could just give us a, a couple of sentences about what the purpose of uh, your uh, constitutional uh, 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 committee was. I mean, you, you, it was co-chaired by uh, uh, by Dr. Rowan Williams, who I think was a former Archbishop of Canterbury. That's right. Tell yeah, us what right. your brief was and what can yeah. came to. Yeah, sure. So um, Rowan Williams and myself are co-chairing what is called an Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales. Um, it was set up by Welsh Government as part, I mean, it, it, without going into enormous detail, the Welsh Government, the Welsh Labour Government was minded to set up the um, Commission before it went into a cooperation agreement with Plaid Cymru. Um, but Plaid Cymru certainly shaped some of the content of the terms of reference of the um, inter of the independent commission. It was set up in November 2021. Um, so we've been working now for just over a year. We published our interim report in December, and I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. But what's unique, I think, about the commission is that um, it's, it comprises representatives of all four main political parties in Wales, so the Welsh Labour, Welsh Conservatives, Plaid Cymru and the Welsh Liberal Democrats. I don't think in Scotland it would be as easy to bring the parties together in a mature conversation around constitutional futures. And that's not I'm not saying that in any derogatory way. I just think clearly the politics plays out differently in our countries. Yeah. Um, then we've got, rep we've got um, other commissioners who've... Who, who are either academics or have worked in civil society or indeed in civil, the civil service. So people that your viewers might know, like Philip Rycroft, who is the PERMSEC in charge of the Department for Exiting the EU in, in Whitehall. Um, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, some, some people may know, who's a health inequalities expert um, at, at um, uh, King's College. And Michael's done a lot of work about innovative um, interventions to tackle health inequalities and how constitutional governance can impact on that. Um, and then we've got people who are academics and so on. So it's a really unusual mix. There's 11 of us working on the commission. We were charged with looking at every potential uh, future constitutional option that Wales might wish to have inside and outside the UK. So obviously... Your viewers are knowledgeable enough to know that means we go all the way from independence um, to the status quo. The status quo in Wales is clearly different to, to the settlement in Scotland because there are additional powers in Scotland over welfare and different tax uh, relationships, um, justice and so on. Yep. So what we've done in our first year is uh, spend some time kind of setting the context for wh what Welsh politics looks like now, the journey um, that's traced us through administrative devolution to, to democratic devolution and the changes that have happened during the last 22 years. We assessed the instability of the union as it currently stands. And in the report, we identified 10 uh, risks or um, weaknesses in current uh, UK politics. And I think, you know, people who are watching and listening would be... Um, would be interested in this because our conclusion from identifying 10 areas, and just to give you a flavor, it's things like, you know, um, over control of the treasury, over uh, financing of devolution, poor, poor intergovernmental relations that are too dominated by London and the center, um, uh, jagged edges in policy competences that create legal issues. Well, you know, you know about that more than anybody given what's going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, the lack of right of Scottish, I think of Welsh people, but I think this applies to Scotland as well, to be able to leverage decisions on their own future. Um, you know, because clearly the, the, the model of parliamentary sovereignty that we have in the UK means that anything can be undone or anything can be refused. And we saw obviously with the Miller case uh, over, uh, and over um, Brexit, how little import the Sewell Convention actually has as a, um, as a principle, because it's not enforceable. 
Um, so anyway, Kate, what we concluded after looking at all of those weaknesses and flaws was that the current constitutional arrangements are not fit for purpose or unstable or um, have fundamental weaknesses. Take your pick from that, really. Um, and then what we did in the main part of our interim report was narrow down the constitutional options that we think have most credibility and most coherence for Wales in the future. And they were entrenching devolution, so, you know, giving it statutory protection, probably through a written constitution, um, stabilising some of the principles that have protected devolution in the past, like Sewell and so on, um, challenging some of that parliamentary sovereignty, because sovereignty, in our opinion, rests amongst the people, not within an institution per se, and certainly not within one institution when there's other democratic institutions. Otherwise, um, can I ask no. you a quick question there? Yeah, please, yeah. Did the, 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 the Conservative members of your, your commission agree with that statement you just made? Yeah, I think that's what it, that's what's really interesting. I mean, there's, there's one representative from each of the parties, so one from the Welsh Conservatives, but she's engaged with all of these conversations with a very, um, a very constructive and a very positive attitude. That doesn't mean she necessarily agrees with everything that goes on in the Commission, and nor would you expect her to. And I'm sure the Plaid Cymru representative doesn't agree with everything that other people say. But every commissioner signed up to the interim report that contained that analysis. And I think that's really important that a, cons you know, that a Welsh Conservative can talk seriously about what's wrong with the Constitution. I think that's a very mature attitude, actually, and one that you know, I'm really pleased that we're able, a conversation I'm very pleased we're able to have in, in Wales. And then going on to the other options, you've got entrenched evolution. We, we're looking at federalist options. Now, federalism has a number of problems, uh, as do all of these options, by the way, because, they, you know, they're massively dependent on a big change and a will for change coming from England. England's 80 percent plus of the population, um, clearly the powerhouse of the, of the UK in terms of economics, at least, or at least the golden triangle around the southeastern London. Um, and at the moment, you know, there's no evidence to suggest that English people or English politicians want a more radical change yeah. because federalism would clearly involve them giving up some of the controls they currently have under devolution to codify, you know, a more balanced model of shared power. But nevertheless, you know, we've had plenty of evidence around federalism and we will investigate that further. And the third option is independence. Um, so, you know, you're... You, you're you and your listeners know a lot about this, having been embroiled in that environment for the last nine years. Well, nine years since the referendum, of course, yeah. but longer than that, of course. Um, and so what we're going to do is drill down using a kind of analysis framework into each of those options. And if I'm being really honest with you, I don't think we will come up with one option because it's unlikely you'd get you know, a, a consensus in that group around one option. But what we're going to do is we're going to apply the same apparatus to each of those options, look at it, looking at it economically, fiscally, politically, um, uh, electorally, constitutionally. Um, and we're going to assess the viability and the appropriateness for the people of Wales of each of those options. And driving it will be some really core values that we've established. I'll shut up in a moment, but let me just tell you these because they are important. Um, the values that we're drive that we're looking to test them against um, are agency, so making sure the people of Wales feel they have a voice and uh, an ability to change the politics and the environment they work in. Subsidiarity, so you know you know about this, trying to make sure that decisions are made at the lowest possible appropriate level. Um, equality, really fundamental that you know there is a balance of power and representation amongst uh, the Welsh population, wherever they come from, whatever sex they are, um, and every other identity that we can we can imagine. Um, and then accountability. And I think this is really important because, you know, at the moment, there are big chunks of policy that affect the lives of Welsh people. For example, prisons, probation, justice, which is not dev devolved in Wales, where the outcomes for the Welsh people are pretty abysmal. We've got the highest incarceration incarceration rates in uh, in Europe, in Wales. Um, we've got very, very poor prisoner outcomes in terms of once they're released from prison. So it's not as if the, the non-devolved system is working. And yet there is very little accountability because Wales is a tiny part of the UK. The number of MPs we elect is going down. So it's going down from 40 to 
uh, 29 to 11, even less voice, in fact, over the non-devolved areas. And yet those are areas that really impact on other policy areas in Wales, like homelessness, yeah. um, employment and so on. So we want to make sure whatever constitutional models we recommend, they will be a way at least of improving the material and economic benefits of the Welsh population. Well, that's very, very helpful. I have some questions, obviously, uh, but I'd like to take a couple from uh, from the audience that have come in. Uh, I, I, first question is, uh, could Laura please comment on the Conservative and Labour Party's respect for the Scottish Government and their democratic right to follow up on manifesto promises? Now, you may prefer not to comment on that. But... Well, what, I, what, I, what I will say is that, you know, this, this kind of encapsulates the problems with UK uh, particularly British politics as it stands. You know, you can't have it both ways. You can't say this is a, a, a union, a voluntary union, where every nation decides themselves to be part of the union, which in my opinion is what it should be, that we should, if you, be, if you believe in the union, and I'm not making any comment for or against, because you'll understand I'm, you know, a neutral chair of an important commission here. But if, if you want to argue the case for the union, then there are cases to be made. Um, you, you heard them in the Scottish referendum, whether you agree with them or not is another thing. But, you know, there's a case around a union of solidarity, of working people, um, of solidarity around the National Health Service and so on and so forth. But it has to be voluntary because in no modern environment can you enforce countries to be part of a political system or union they don't wish to. Um, so if you argue that the union is a voluntary union, there has to be an opportunity for nations to secede from that union as well and to have democratic decisions about how they do it. And of course, therein lies the nub, I'm sure, of the question that's um, that's come in, you know, because it's clear um, and not just for, during this governmental period, but, but previous to that, that there's been a pretty lopsided approach to respect for the different nations and the different governments of the United Kingdom. Um, you know, the, the, some of the decisions that um, the Welsh government has made have been ridden over um, during COVID, for example. Um, and so, you know, I have sympathy for the position uh, that there must be a route into the union or protecting the union, but there must also be routes out of the union if it, if it is the democratic will so expressed by the people of each nation. Oh, that's interesting. Catherine Wilkinson is asking about broadcasting. Uh, do you have a view? There's a big issue in, in Scotland about Scottish games not being shown on television. Uh, ah, yeah. okay. I'm not sure if that applies in Wales too, but uh, it, it's fairly routine for people to want to watch a game that the Scotland football team are playing, only to find out they're watching uh, England playing somebody, perhaps in a friendly. Uh, yeah. And that that really sort of gets yeah. us. Right. Well, I have to say that we don't have that issue in Wales for one big reason, that the, the deal that we have with the broadcasters in Wales that the FAW negotiated gives exclusive rights to we, Sky cover our games, but yeah. it gives exclusive rights to the Welsh language channel S4C as well. Oh. Um, and we've negotiated that with UEFA. So there is no there is never a game for the Welsh national oh. team that isn't shown uh, in, on Welsh television. And of course, not all the population can speak Welsh in Wales. You know, the, the figure is more, uh, you know, just above, just above a quarter, but everything is shown with subtitles. Um, so if if a non-Welsh speaking person wants to watch the Welsh games, which they do, um, they can watch it with subtitles. And actually the coverage on S4C is much better than on um, Sky or BBC or ITV, in my opinion, in terms of football coverage. They've got better analysts. They, they've always involved women and men analysts, not and in a very natural way. They've some, yeah. some of my former colleagues who are international footballers um, are match pundits and match analysts on S4C. And so we don't have that problem. The only time we'd have that problem would be when, if, if we had um, uh, an issue with the Premier League and club football yeah. competing directly with our Welsh clubs in the Welsh Premier League. But at national level and international level, we don't have that issue, no. But, I mean, if you're asking my, my opinion, then, of course, Scot Scottish games should have priority in Scotland because, you know, football, football. there's no such thing as British football, OK, in UEFA. There is literally no such thing. There is no country called Britain in UEFA or the UK, by the way. Um, and the, the four nations have exactly the same status within all UEFA uh, decision-making and apparatus. 
And if anything, the Welsh and the Scots probably have more influence, I'd say, because there's a, a body of countries in Europe who like England less because of their size and their history. So, you know, it's one of those few environments where being Welsh and Scottish gives you more power rather than less power. Well, it seems to me that maybe the SFA ought to be exercising some of that power by going down the route that the Football Association of Wales has gone down, because there is a Scottish channel that is operated, yeah. I think, by the BBC called ALBA. Yeah, of course. Just, I mean, they can easily run the, the, the same programmes on ALBA. Uh, and it, it, I think it's a, a, a Gaelic channel, so they, they could do the same as they do in Wales. If they have to do it, put subtitles on it. <laughs> Who cares? But it sounds to me it's an entirely practical proposition, and it hasn't been properly exercised by the sound of it. So there you are, Catherine. Maybe what should happen is somebody should contact the SFA and say, why don't you get the same deal that the Football Association of Wales has secured? Well, I mentioned minority language status because UEFA has a commitment to protect minority languages. So that, that's another kind of leverage you have if you, you know, if you talk about Scots and Scots Gaelic and Welsh. Okay. Well, we've only got you for another uh, 15, 20 minutes and I would like to ask a few questions, if I may, uh, about... Uh, the interim report, and you mentioned the three uh, possibilities, i.e. that yes. entrenched and very de devolution, uh, a federal arrangement of some kind or independence. If we could take the first one first, if we may. Uh, I mean, it seems to me, and you identify this in your report, that the biggest stumbling block here is the lack of a written constitution that would yes. safeguard any changes that were agreed because after the 2014 uh, referendum in Scotland, the, all the parties got together and one of their, the top of their list of agreed priorities was the, the Scottish Parliament uh, would be, as it were, completely autonomous to make its own decisions within, within the reserved, within the, the non-reserved areas, that is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and nobody would interfere with that. Uh, that was never done. No legislation was ever passed. That was an empty promise, an empty vow that, that was never fulfilled. And it seems to me that, might, and that was in 2014 when there was a, you could, you could might have argued that there was a more, um, a less challenging environment towards devolution uh, then than, than there is now, um, mm -hmm. based on what we see round about us and, and what's happening at Westminster. Uh, so the, the, my question essentially is, uh, and it's a difficult one for you to answer, but the, 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 the present arrangements at Westminster do not suggest that uh, any any change like that would be welcomed. E even taking the very yeah. first, i.e., entrenched or embedded devolution, because it would have to, it would require a written constitution. I don't see any appetite for that. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be secure. Uh, yeah, I think that requires an acceptance that uh, that the parliament is not sovereign, but the people are sovereign. Yes, and that's a major change, and it would require Westminster to completely turn on its head the present arrangement. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But look, you're absolutely right, and I'm not going to, you know, con I'm not going to argue against any of that. But what I will say is that each of the three options that we've identified as being potential runners have inherent difficulties with them as well as massive advantages in terms of what the people of Wales are telling us they want from their politics. So nobody's nobody's pretending that any of these are easy. And if you think that the entrenching of devolution is easier than independence, then I think you need to think again because they're, you know, that at one at one level, independence is more straightforward than entrenching devolution yeah. because you're trying to do it within a a, a state apparatus that doesn't work in that way, but I think you know. So we know the we know the problems. We know that anything that can be decided, at, anything that's done at the moment in legislation, could be repealed by another government. We know that parliamentary sovereignty um, is interpreted as resting entirely within um, uh, the Houses of Parliament rather than within um, the elected uh, institutions in Holyrood and in Cardiff Bay. So we know all of that. But we have to think about how we remedy a broken system. And so these these uh, situations, these solutions are attempts at trying to do that. The other thing that I didn't mention about uh, entrenched devolution was that it was also about trying to make the model of devolution that we have um, more, 
more sensible from a policy point of view. So it makes no sense, it seems to me, when you read the Lord Thomas report on the devolution of justice, to have just binned that report as the MOJ did and gave it no credibility whatsoever. I mean, this was a Lord Chief Justice saying that there was an unequivocal and inarguable case for devolving justice to Wales. And look, you know, the, the, as Scots, there are three bits to any political system, an executive, a legislature, and a judiciary. That that happens everywhere, pretty much everywhere in the world. Three legs to the stool. In Wales, we've only got two legs to the stool, despite having a body of Welsh law, as well as a body of Welsh and English law and a body of UK law. But we have we have a system of... Um, of independent, um, separate legislation and, uh, 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 and a criminal justice system without having accountability or control over it. And that makes no sense whatsoever. So part of entrenching devolution has to look at areas where the constitution currently makes no uh, constitutional sense. And I would say that's over justice. It's over things like the partial devolution of transport, so we only have partial devolution over trains um, and other other areas of transport like ports. Um, I know this is controversial when you talk about Barnet because Scotland is in a, a much better position with regard to receipts from Barnet than Wales is. But if you take the example of HS2, the high speed train uh, line, there is no Barnet consequential for Wales from HS2. Scotland's had some. Wales has no Barnet consequential, despite not an inch of track being in Wales. Um, and now there are a lot of reasons for that. And I'm not saying that's just to do with transport devolution, but the cost of us, what we would have gained from, um, from uh, a Barnet consequential from HS2 would have allowed us to almost revolutionise the key railway lines in Wales. Um, so, you know, there, there, and this leads us to the arguments that many people have given us for independence, of course, you know, that, um, whilst independence is not easy and economically might prove more problematic for Scotland and for Wales initially, <laughs> the system currently isn't working economically either. Therefore, it is incumbent on us to look at alternatives. So, I mean, going, going back to the point about um, the uh, other other areas that could be devolved, we, we've set up subgroups that are looking at broadcasting, uh, transport, energy, um, employment, justice um, and it's really important that we do that properly you know that we investigate the policy benefits of devolving probation and prisons and uh, uh, youth justice and so on because you know I don't think we're going to win any arguments just talking about constitutional principles we'll win arguments by showing that there is a material benefit to ordinary <clears throat> people from having constitutional change yeah I, I think I think the concern that uh, I, I would I would put to you is this uh, let's assume that you're successful uh, and you, you catch a tide at Westminster and people say, absolutely, you're absolutely right, Laura, um, you know, we should get this justice thing sorted out. Uh, that report was perfect. We, do, we see no problem with it. We were just overburdened. We want to accommodate you as best we can, only to find out, and all these things get done, only to find out, as happened in Scotland's case, that a short time down, down the line, uh, the, the, the Parliament of Wales uh, passes an act, <laughs> as happened in Scotland recently, and uh, the Secretary of State says, "I ain't having this." Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and all of a sudden, <clears throat> the, the 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 thrust of devolution is is completely uh, counter. It's undermined uh, because then people who thought this was a terrific idea are saying, "Well, there's not much point to it if it can be." overridden at any any moment in time. But it but surely that's the reality of it. I mean, power devolved is power retained. So therefore it's on that level, it's perfectly right that the the, the central organization, wherever it is, uh, retains the right to override any legislation. But that puts the whole business of embedding into a very sharp focus indeed, don't you yes. think? Yeah, it does. Of course it does, because, you know, the, the Sewell protocol has been ignored, you know, not just over Brexit and the internal market, but, you know, on other smaller issues as well. And obviously the intervention um, over the past week around the gender recognition uh, legislation is, is another example. And, you know, I mean, I think 
you you've got to strip that away from what the issue is, haven't you? It it could be it could have been any other issue really that the Scottish uh, yeah. government and yeah. the Scottish Parliament had legislated on. The point is not what whether you agree or not with gen, you know gender recognition and self self identification and lowering the age and all the rest of it. That's kind of immaterial. The, the issue the issue is over whether another Parliament has the right to. Um, to challenge the democratic legislative process as agreed by the parliament in Scotland in this case. And I think that is fundamentally wrong, but it's, it's, a, it's a reflection of the weakness of our constitutional settlement, isn't it? That so much has been done by precedent, protocol, by um, goodwill um, or bad will at times, but goodwill generally to keep things, to keep the show on the road. Um, and, you know that can't continue. Um, the one thing I will say, and I think this is this is really important um, contextual consideration, which is that if Labour wins the next UK general election, as it's predicted to do by its current stand in in the polls, no guarantees, of course, because a lot can happen in in you know thirteen months and so on. But but if it were to win the um, UK election and form a government, then it. it would be absolutely criminal if it didn't try and tackle constitutional change whilst dealing with the other economic issues it will face. Because, you know, it, it's almost impossible to proclaim yourself as a democratic political party that is in support of devolution and uh, the voices and the rights of Scottish and Welsh people to make decisions over the areas that are devolved to each of us. Um, without trying to engineer a different constitutional framework. Because we've seen with gender recognition, we've seen with Brexit, we've seen with Sewell generally, that um, these things will be manipulated by the centre. If mm -hmm. Labour doesn't grab hold of this agenda, it'll end up falling into the same trap and it will end up eroding devolution and creating conflict between uh, the centre and the nations in a way that won't, won't benefit it as well. So, you know, you can hope, you can but hope, and maybe I'm being too um, optimistic here, but you can but hope that at least Labour will come in with a commitment to doing some serious I hope, constitutional change. I hope you're right, Laura, but there are two straws in the wind that suggest that that hope may be misplaced. One is that uh, Lisa Nandy has said today that she would uh, wish... Uh, that Nicola Sturgeon didn't take part in any uh, uh, UK-wide debates because her party doesn't stand in England. And presumably that uh, pre uh, prescription would then apply to Plaid Cymru as well. Yes, yeah. Uh, that is not, that's not extending the hand of friendship. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the other thing that's, of course, happened is that Keir Starmer said categorically he would never cooperate with SNP MPs at Westminster. Uh, I'm not quite sure of the logic of all of this, but uh, it, uh, when we interviewed David Clark, who was an advisor to Robin Cook, uh, you may recall he was the Foreign Secretary at one time, uh, he said that in his view, as a, a, a Labour supporter, he's, he claimed that Labour was the most uh, uh, nationalist, British nationalist grouping at Westminster. Uh, yeah, well, look, you know, we, we've, you know, we, we have a different angle on it, clearly, or different perspective on it from Wales, because we have a Welsh Labour Party that is open to a conversation um, about independence. Uh, there is a group within Welsh Labour that campaigns for independence, and some of them were candidates in the last Senate elections. Now, let's not overplay that. That's not the majority position in Welsh Labour. You know, when we've heard evidence from the First Minister and various other people, um, various other people from Labour, they've argued for greater powers and some for a, what they call radical federalism. Um, but, you know, we, we we had a session last week in the Commission with Gordon Brown and Jim Gallagher to talk about the Brown report. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm not going to be critical or, or lavish praise on that because, um, you know, it clearly touches on areas that we, we're also touching on we haven't yet reported. There's a big chunk in the Brown report that... Um, creates a space to um, that we that they expect us to fill on Wales. Mm. And I'm sure people have their comments on what it says on Scotland. But, you know, I think some of the constitutional change proposed there around reform of the Lords, creation of a nation, creation of a chamber of nations and regions, 
um, the some of the economic drivers for change are quite important in relation to England. Yeah. But you know, Welsh Labour is different. You know, and, and let's let's be fair, Welsh Labour has got a winning recipe here as well. It's won the last hand, the last for a century. It hasn't lost an election, yeah. um, a national election, which tells you a lot about where the Welsh people are in relation to decisions over areas like this. And and I think actually. Um, Scottish Labour, you know, would, would do well to look at how Welsh Labour have managed to offset the challenge of Plaid Cymru and incorporate them in, in essence by, by being more committed to constitutional change and to um, a, a, a more Welsh version of um, Labour. Of course, that could all go up in the air with, with, with Keir Starmer becoming Prime Minister for years. Um, and, and, you know, I, that's pure speculation. But but I do think, you know, it's it's a good thing that we're having a more nuanced debate about constitutional change. It can't just be about the union and independence because there are there are a lot of spaces in between that. And most mostly that's where the people lie in Wales anyway. You know, they're not in the caps of the two extremes. So. Yeah. I, I think you're right. And I think particularly in the case of Wales, it, people were well advised to listen to the very thoughtful remarks that you've made tonight. Otherwise, there's a real danger that Wales will head in the same direction as Scotland, where the debate will become polarised, because that's what happens when yeah, of course. The, the middle ground is then becomes despised rather than being honoured. And, and, and that's a great pity, it seems to me. But there you are. Uh, we, <laughs> we've taken out 46 minutes of your time, Laura. I'm very sensitive and conscious of the fact that you've given so much of your time to us tonight. And I'd hate for you to, to, to miss your next meeting. I'm terribly grateful. Are there any uh, uh, points that you would like to make before you go that would, you feel would perhaps I'm covered? Um, you would like? Yeah, just, just well, just to say that you know, I I I would hope that um, by by the work we do in the commission, that it it gives us a sort of impetus to have conversations between the countries of the UK and particularly between Scotland and Wales because I think that's something that's missing from the current debate. You yes. know, there's yep. there's very little kind of uh, interchange of views between Scotland and Wales on the kind of futures we want. And maybe maybe we just agree to disagree. You know, if there's a majority in favour of independence in Scotland, there isn't in Wales, that's OK. It might turn the other way around over time, you know, and there's a, a majority in favour of Wales, in Wales and not so in Scotland. But yeah. I don't think we have the dialogue at the moment, and I think that's a real shame. We have a really interesting dialogue uh, at the moment around uh, electoral reform. I think that's really critical because the the, P, the the hybrid PR system that we use in Holyrood and Cardiff Bay currently is not PR. Let's get away from that. I know you have STV in local elections in Scotland, but, you know, the, the AMS system is loaded in favour of the party that's been in power and the incumbent. You know, we're, mm. we're looking to move away from that, but unfortunately not in the right direction. As I wrote a report as part of an expert panel calling for an enlarged Senate, because the Senate's massively underpowered with 60 members, um, elected by STV with built-in quotas for gender. Um, unfortunately, the, the, well, fortunately, the legislation will go ahead uh, to create a, a bigger assembly of between 90 and 100 members. But but the, the, the debate is centred on creating a closed list system of uh, uh, for the electoral system which I find very problematic because it yeah. gives more power to the hands of the parties in in, yeah. in the place of the electors. So I hope that if you have that debate in Scotland, you know, you learn from the successes we had in driving the, the discussion, but then off, obviously some of the failures we've had in getting the political parties to operate less out of party interest and more in public interest. Yeah. Well, I wish you all every success with that. And I, I'd love it if you were on the UFA Executive Committee. Oh, thank and you. I'll keep in to... touch and let you know. But yeah, it's been a pleasure to be on the show and lovely to speak to um, people in uh, my other favourite country of Scotland. <laughs> thank you again, Laura. Take care. And I hope you thank make you. the next meeting in time. Take I hope care. so. Thanks nice very much, much, guys. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Yeah. Well, there we are. A very, very interesting uh, discussion indeed. Uh, and a big thank you to, uh, to, to Laura for joining us. Um, she's very busy, as you might imagine. Uh, she chairs with uh, uh, 
the Right Honourable Right Reverend uh, Dr. Rowan Williams, uh, who's an ex-Archbishop uh, of Canterbury. She co-chairs this uh, commission on looking at constitutional change for Wales. And, and she's right. I mean, it's, it, it's extraordinary, isn't it, that in Wales people can get together right across the political spectrum uh, to be and discuss and think about the best way forward for Wales. I mean, it's just almost inconceivable to imagine, right, that this would might happen or anything close to it might happen in Scotland. And perhaps as we discussed, because the debate has just gotten so polarized that people have come to the conclusion that, you know, we, we don't speak to them, they don't speak to us, you know, and it, it's a crying shame. I suggested in my column that maybe a vehicle for bringing people together or at least reducing the, the sense of uh, hostility across the political spectrum would be to form a constitutional convention and invite all the parties to participate, pretty much as, as Laura has done with her commission. But you see there again, you, you run into the difficulty that those who uh, are completely opposed to any form of constitutional change uh, may not wish to participate. Well, that would be to their great disadvantage and a huge loss, I suspect. But what's terribly wrong with forming a constitutional convention to produce a draft constitution for Scotland? After all, if we became independent tomorrow, uh, we wouldn't have a constitution to speak of, unless the the one that was uh, uh, the draft or interim constitution that was generated back in 2014 was was put into place. But that would seem to be a shame because there's a big difference between 2023 uh, and 2014. Uh, and things have moved on since then, so there might be elements of that draft or interim constitution that need to be updated. So it would seem to me to be a, a terribly good thing in principle, if, uh, as well as practice, to get people together to talk about a constitution for Scotland. Apart from anything else, right? as I say, uh, right now, unless the 2014 version that was that was produced back then was immediately put into, into place, uh, we'd be working off the UK constitution, such as it is, I, it would be unwritten. And, and the executive in, uh, in an independent Scotland would then inherit all the powers, i.e. complete powers, complete sovereignty that, that the Westminster Parliament presently enjoys. And I don't think anyone wants that. I mean, we've seen what happens when you give unlimited, unfettered power to an executive with a majority where it can just bestride the political arrangements and say, look, we, we, we don't care what you think. We don't care how we spend money, we can tell lies, we can be as corrupt as we like, and there's zero you can do about it. And if we find we don't like our leader, <laughs> whom you elected way back when, <laughs> we'll just get rid of them and put somebody else in power. Who are we? Yeah, around about 18 to 20,000 uh, uh, cons uh, Conservative Party members who elect their own leader and that leader automatically becomes prime minister. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. None of us should stand for that. It is truly outrageous. We've become inured to a huge and enormous uh, democratic deficit. And because we've become inured to it, we live with it. Instead of saying, up with this, I will not put. Because it's outrageous that a couple of thousand people can elect your PM and replace your PM, right? This is supposed to, I mean, we talk about general elections. We talk about all the parties that get together and then they compete and they debate and all the rest of it. It's meaningless. If one of the parties that gets elected can say, well, I thought we don't like the PM, we're going to change it. Well, yeah, by all means, put yourself up for re-election. I don't want to do that. Why not? Well, I might not, I might not, our guy might not get in. Well, that's the whole point of democracy. You can't just say democracy works because it works for me. You have to take the rough with the smooth. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. Otherwise, it's not democratic. Once in a while, maybe a lot of the time, you don't get what you want. Well, Scotland hasn't had its <laughs> what it wants for, for decades. You know, and I, I find it frankly astonishing that, <laughs> that, that people persist in uh, acknowledging uh, as the rightful uh, uh, administration a bunch of folks who just elect and re-elect themselves at will. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. And what do you do? People on social media all the time say, hey, we want to get rid of these guys. Well, get rid of them then. Oh, we can't do that. We have to wait for an election. Really? I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm 
hugely in favour of democracy, but there comes a point where you have to say, this is not democratic. What they're doing is not democratic. You'll see on the screen just now, there's marches and rallies coming up. I would encourage people to go to some of these. I would encourage MSPs, I would encourage MPs to go to these meetings as well, these sessions as well. Because apart from anything else, you find out what people are thinking. It's not just a bad thing. Uh, because if democracy means anything, it ought to mean, as Laura was pointing out, that the sovereignty is vested in the people, not in an institution, not in parliament, but in the people. Parliament should reflect the needs of the people. And if it fails to meet their needs, it should be replaced. Because it seems to me that's what democracy is. You know, if you're not meeting the needs of the people who, in fact, have hired you, they have the right to fire you. <laughs> but if sovereignty is vested in an institution, ah, then the institution decides who should govern. I think you and I should decide who should govern. Let me make a few concluding remarks before we finish tonight. Uh, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Laura. Uh, I mean, I, I thought much of what she said had real relevance to Scotland as well as, uh, as Wales. Uh, and I'm full of admiration of how she's pulled people together. I, I do hope she gets elected to the UFA Executive Committee because heavens above, could you imagine the difference somebody like that could make? <laughs> It's a great pity she wasn't there before Qatar. Uh, well, a big thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you for your questions. And we tried to cover as, as many as we could in the time available. Uh, as ever, we have a formidable list of guests lined up for future shows. Uh, and remember, if you want to find out about the TN show, TNT show or other shows uh, and events and pod podcasts on Independence Live, go to independencelive.net. You'll see it all there. As it said on the screen, look out for Andy Whiteman and Professor Danny Dorling in the next few weeks. Uh, it's going to be some really interesting stuff coming up there. As always, uh, a reminder to look out for Elliot Bulmer's column in the Sunday National this weekend. Uh, you'll find it in the Seven Days Supplement. If you like it, uh, contact the editor and tell him you like it. We've heard tonight that the head of the BBC is concerned about revelations, revelations that he has facilitated a loan of 800k to Boris Johnson at the time of his appointment. It seems he has asked a BBC committee to examine these allegations and the committee is to be headed up by the same man. <laughs> I, the BBC head. <laughs> I'll head up a committee examining the BBC head. Only in the UK. In other news, um, I hope you uh, I hope you managed to catch a snatch of this on uh, YouTube because I don't think the BBC coverage reflected its full awfulness. But uh, an MP called uh, Tulip Sadiq, I think uh, a London MP, asked the Prime Minister about the welfare of 200 unaccompanied migrant children who've just gone missing. They've just disappeared. Nobody knows where they are. Nobody seems terribly responsible. And in the midst of the debate, Tory MP Jonathan Gullis heckled, well, they shouldn't have come here illegally. Now, apparently he's a former teacher. Maybe whoever, when he leaves the political field, should worry about him ever becoming a teacher again. Uh, meanwhile, uh, without a trace of irony, the PM said he's worried about organized gangs. He says this while the rest of us are looking at his front bench. Irony is dead as somebody much more gifted than me once said, sick a parcel of rogues in a nation. Thank you for watching tonight. Look after each other, stay safe, and we'll see you next week at the same time. Good night. <laughs>